I think I should have gotten hazard pay for reading this book. Um, <laughs> but I, I did do it every fucking word. Um, the kind of crazy thing about this book is that it's so it, it, it makes some like really outlandish claims, some just a, some like false claims for sure. Like her her grasp of history is very strange. Um, and it also has some like really wild out, outlandish ideas, like, for instance, like basically what like in these diversity trainings that she holds and these are all sort of in a corporate context or nonprofit context or academia in these institutions robin d'angelo is paid very handsomely to go to these places and uh tell white people basically how to talk to to, to non-white people um which she doesn't seem to be very good at because she much of the book is about how she fails how <laughs> there's so much backlash she'll do these trainings and they to, it, according to her they seem to end with like white women in tears and, and uh white men like pounding on the desk and, and raised and she instead of looking at the response to her trainings and saying like maybe this isn't working that to her is just further proof that what she's doing is correct. Um, her whole concept of white fragility is basically like, if I tell you that you're racist and you push back against that or you defend yourself, that is an example of white fragility. So the more you the more you defend yourself, the more you argue with her, um, the more, I guess, the more white fragility, the more racism you have within you. But so the really crazy part about this book is that it does have all these sort of outlandish rules about how white people should interact with everybody else in the world. Um, but it's also boring at the same time. And so I mean, so I think that's one of the biggest the biggest sins of the book is that it's super repetitive. It's not interesting. And it's written in a way it's in this sort of, you know, she's an academic trying to write a pop book and she fails at it. She doesn't create like the basic like, you know, she doesn't make a narrative. Um, but it's written in a way so that I think the casual reader, like the book club wine mom or whatever, can read it and it's going to nod along. And, and probably a woman who actually doesn't have that much experience with uh, with non-white people in her life who might just like, you know, like Deborah, the black woman in accounting or whatever. And so she doesn't have this sort of critical thinking skills to say like, oh, this is actually fucked up. And this book is actually going to make relationships between white people and everybody else more strained and more fraught. Um, so... I hate this book. I hate that this book is a bestseller. Um, I think if I were a black anti-racist, I would also hate this book because this is now the most successful of that particular of that particular canon. Um, so, but there's the backlash to Robin D'Angelo has begun. So now we just have to wait for the backlash for um, all of the other anti-racist scholars. I'm looking forward to that next. I don't know if I'll be participating in that one um, as much because there is this like strange, you know. Um, sort of rule of identity politics and as much as I, I hate many aspects of identity politics I also um, am comp feel compelled to abide by some of the rules in some cases which is as a white person it's very easy for me to critique Robin DiAngelo it's a lot harder for me to critique someone na like uh, Ijomo Luo or someone like that as much as I would like to. Camille I want to bring you in on that what, what do you think about that when you when you hear that you know, people feel like, because I think that this is something I've noticed too, is that people look at a book like this and they're like, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't seem logical, but who am I to say I'm an X, right? I'm not a Y. She's telling me how the Y's are, how the X's have treated the Y's. And mm -hmm. who am I to question that? Because, you know, I don't have that experience. I'm not from that background so on and so forth. What do you think when you hear something like that? Well, it's certainly rational, and, and we should acknowledge that. I am aware of the fact that people take a very real risk when they transgress those rules. Um, so I can appreciate Katie's trepidation as I can anyone, everyone else's. Um, at the same time, I think it is absolutely essential that we transgress those rules. Um, those rules don't ought not be respected. Um, the kind of claims that are made in a book like White Fragility, as with a book like Stamped, uh, from the beginning and the remixed version, Stamped, which is co-written by a friend of mine, Jason Reynolds, who I went to college with. Um, <laughs> all of these books have factual claims in them, uh, which can be refuted. And in other cases, they have philosophical claims that are made that, you know, the, do you think this is at all respectable? Is it something that can hold water? Is it tautological and circular? And if it is, then we have an obligation to say so. And I think that's increasingly the case. You know, uh, if you'd asked me a question about this 36 months ago, I would have said, you know, fine. You don't want to say anything, don't, because you're taking real risks and that's a problem. Um, I am increasingly concerned that the, the, the vast majority of people who sit through diversity training programs in their offices, who quietly say nothing while they're confronted with ideas that they wholeheartedly object to, 
um, that it, there's something inherently dangerous about that status quo and about us being dominated by fear that something bad might happen to us because we're being confronted with ideas that we dislike, that we disagree with, that we fundamentally know are wrong. Assertions about who we are and about what we are that are completely inconsistent with what we know about ourselves. Um, and we're accepting them. And we're accepting them because we're told we can't have a perspective on it because of what we look like or where we're from. And I'm including myself in that, despite the fact that I don't check that box um, in, this, in this particular context. But there are other conversations that I get that treatment with as a cisgender male, right? Um, and I don't, I don't respect those rules. And I don't think we ought to respect those rules. And I think we have a real, a real there's, there's an imperative um, that, that we ought to start to start to try and push back against those rules. And it's going to cost us something and it's going to require a little bit of bravery. And I, I can't say that you won't get into trouble with HR and you might not even lose your job in some instances. But I do think that we're at a point now <laughs> where that's, that's necessary. It's necessary for us to stand on principle on things like this. And with respect to the book, just at a very high level, um, I do, I've, I've read parts of this book I've tried my best to read all of it. At some point, I will, but it's a very bad book. Um, boring is is exactly right. Uh, I think you know philosophically, it isn't particularly smart. Um, intellectually, it isn't challenging or very demanding. Um, the the most of the arguments are circular and tautological. There are lots of things that she doesn't understand about history. There are many arguments in there, like the Jackie Robinson bit that oh, I actually find. Oh, God, the fucking Jackie Robinson thing. Okay, well, let's offensive. explain that. Let's, uh, the, the reporter, uh, Matt Tybee, he wrote a kind of Substack newsletter about this. He highlighted a lot of people on the internet were joking about it. But let's explain this for the for the viewers who haven't gone through this. Maybe, maybe Katie, you want to take that on? So she writes, I don't have the passage right in front of me, but she writes, there's just a couple of paragraphs in the book where she writes about Jackie Robinson. And she says that the reason she, <laughs> she says that basically white people are under the impression that the reason Jackie Robinson was this, was the first black man in major league baseball was because he was the first black man who was good enough to play. Like he was the first one with skills, which is just like, nobody fucking believes that. Like the Negro leagues are not a secret. Jim Crow is not a secret. Like nobody believes that Jackie Robinson was obviously a great baseball player. But the reason that, that, that he's held up on a pedestal is not just because he was a great baseball player is because he actually did, you know, break this racial boundary. And she Mm -hmm. just totally flattens that. And she makes it seem like he was like, like it's it's offensive it's insulting to to his own legacy she makes it seem like he was granted this opportunity by like by by white people who finally found like okay that negro over there he's good enough to play baseball which is just like (laughs) nobody nobody fucking believes that nobody believes that except for robin d'angelo apparently (laughs) well this is what this is what gets me about so much of this genre of writing is that it seems like everyone's lives revolve around this yes. superstructure or this mm-hmm. cosmic uh, phantasm of white supremacy, white people. Uh, if someone succeeds, it's because they were allowed to by white people. If someone fails, it's because, you know, white people didn't do enough to help them. You know, they don't seem to be independent actors in the world. And I, I, they're, I've they're noticed not. that. And so, okay, so I, at one point, she's, she has a passage, and I read this passage about Bernie Sanders and how Yes. Uh, there were some Black Lives Matter protesters that interrupted Bernie Sanders in Seattle. Yes. Some people booed them, got angry. Okay, those people were standing out there for hours in the sun to see a politician speak. It's kind of understandable that they may be a little upset they get interrupted. The exact, Almost the exact same scenario played out in Atlanta when Hillary Clinton spoke. Some Black Lives Matter uh, protesters interrupted her. The crowd, who was mostly Black, booed them, and they got ejected. <laughs> it, what, but... D'Angelo interpreted the Seattle event as a matter of whiteness. This is what white people do. You know, they're always mm-hmm. ready to boo and shout down and to put down minorities, to put them in their place. And it just, you know, she never considers the idea that I mean, perhaps that tactic just kind of makes people angry. And it almost always does when you bum rush the stage, when you interrupt, when you heckle. People in those crowd environments tend to respond that way. Here in the United States, among every racial group, among every probably culture in the world, I think you see similar reactions. But she interprets this as a quality of white people and the white people are allowing you to do this or allowing you to do that. She doesn't really think that people have a process that who aren't white have a process which they can follow where they can determine what would be effective in a particular crowd or what wouldn't be effective in a particular crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think, you know, the, the interesting thing here is I don't think that if you asked her, she would say like race is a biological, you know, entity that it's an essential kind of characteristic of somebody. 
but she's almost acting as if it is right mm -hmm. and i think a lot of this goes back to like we're emotional animals human beings like we our emotions re are under underneath our rational kind of thinking processes and i think that at some level she really does think this is a real thing like she thinks that this is how white people are this is how black people are this is how asians are this is how latinos are so on and so forth and if you read if you read the book and if she never mentioned biology once part of you i feel like at an emotional level must think this is an actual concrete thing this is not something that's made and unmade every day through our interactions i mean did, did you get that sense reading it canal well she does explicitly say that it is a social construct and that it's not biological and genetic but as you mentioned she does behave at as if as if it is completely immutable and apparently it's rendered that way by politics but it it seems to be more than that you know the the fact that this is a book she she takes pains to explain that this is a book written for white people and when she uses sort of us in that context she's talking to her her fellow white brethren uh, the the challenge though is i don't know what this would look like if it was a book written for black people because in her imagining, black people are an object to be acted upon. They, to the extent they have any sort of will of their own, it's inhibited, it's inhibited by whatever it is white people want to do to them. And it is a really deplorable uh, sort of view of, of the, the autonomy of black people. Um, and it certainly degrades and diminishes any sort of accomplishments that they may have achieved in society. And it strikes me that there is a really uncomfortable but important symmetry that exists between anti-racist ideas and white supremacy on the other hand. Um, both of them uh, operate under the presumption that whiteness is the most important thing in society. It is ultimately the thing that will make decisions about who is successful and who fails. And um, to, to the extent there's even any hope of redemption, and it's not obvious to me that there is, because her prescription really is that you'll, you'll have to work on this. You'll have to work on it forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, it, it's, it's a maddening sort of uh, a religious obsession is what she's prescribing for people, where you can forever... Um, you know, pray and say all the Hail Marys, <laughs> and you'll never be granted access to heaven. The most you can hope for um, is that some will, someone will perhaps occasionally acknowledge your suffering. Um, and <laughs> it's, 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 it's sad and it's depressing. It also is so badly argued that I, I find myself frequently wondering if anyone has actually read this book as opposed to simply ordering it and carrying it around <laughs> as a prop that yeah. they can be seen with. Posting a picture on your Instagram. Yeah, like Michael got <laughs> in the office is like, have I read this book? No, I own it. Yeah, you know, but right. like, you know, it's one of those like you put it on the bookshelf so you know you have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was actually, I was, I was like, I had it in a, I said this on my podcast. Um, so if you guys listen, you might've heard this, but I, I got the book. I didn't want to give her money. Um, so I bought the book used off of a guy in Seattle and I, I like paid him more than the, than the actual cost on the, of the book. Um, so I was sitting in my car reading the book while I was waiting for my wife to run some errands. And uh, so the, the book is out. I was like embarrassed about the fact that I had to, you know, I didn't want anybody to see it. But this, uh, so a black woman walked up to my car and asked me for money. And I'm reading this book called White Fragility while this woman is asking me for money. And I said, no, not only did I said, no, I like made a big show of like going through my bag and pretending that I didn't have any cash on me because I didn't want to give her any money while I'm reading this fucking book. And I can just imagine what this woman was thinking right now. Like you're trying to be the anti-racist while also like refusing to give me $20 or whatever. I'm not one of the good whites, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that's a curious question does she believe that you can be such a thing it doesn't sound like it reading her and listening to her speak she doesn't even seem to think that she's one of the good ones because she's constantly like she's also constantly failing as uh you know she talks about how she like she has to apologize in this like one like prescriptive way of like an embarrassing sort of humiliating way that i would not want to be on either receipt on the receiving end either either um so i can't imagine yeah it's just it is religious it's just you have to go to mass every day you have to confess your sins every day and maybe a Immediately, you're sort of renewed for a second, but then you know uh, something. You'll commit some microaggression, and once again, you have to you have to repent. Um, so there really doesn't seem to be any clear path out of you know white fragility or being inherently racist. Um, and she doesn't talk about. That's the other thing about the book is that. We're in this moment right now where lots of people are talking about structural racism. She doesn't really talk about structural racism. It's this very solipsistic, narcissistic look at the individual. Um, whereas, you know, I mean, I'm I'm like no expert on this stuff, but do people's like inner 
it, like implicit biases actually is that what actually makes life harder for non-white people for, like I can't imagine that it's sort of the thoughts that that the implicit bias because there's not even there like the research that we've seen on implicit bias testing shows that implicit bias is not necessarily connected to actions right so even if you, even if all people do have some sort of implicit bias which might be true um, might not be but it might be true let's just say for the sake of argument that it is if that doesn't translate to actions then why even focus on the implicit bias in the first place yeah there's something about you know the the narrative surrounding structural racism and implicit bias and all these other things that are becoming increasingly common things uh, for people to hear about um, that that the thing that bothers me most about it uh, is the degree to which we make it narrowly about the way that it impacts black people without thinking about how this might pertain to the nation as a whole, perhaps white people in particular in some instances. Um, I think about the South, I think about the economic privation that's been visited upon it since the end of the Civil War. It's it's rather slow um, economic development, the intense uh, crushing poverty that is suffered by people in of all races in different neighborhoods in the South, um, higher crime rates in certain neighborhoods. And I think also, and perhaps most, um, and, and it sad, saddens me most when I think about someone who is a white racist. I mean, someone who actually has like retrograde ideas about white supremacy um, and about the, the horrible um, backwardness of the black man and their inability to be successful, a person like that is, is so far removed from polite society, so far outside the bounds of what will ever allow them to be someone who can be upwardly, mo upwardly mobile and successful. Like Those people are victims too. And those beliefs are beliefs that can be cultivated by an individual, but more often than not are taught. It's a, it's a sort of, uh, you know, a, a, a bacterial phage if, if ideas can be sort of cast as viruses. And it's a horrible thing for anyone to have to deal with. And it's something that I, I think a lot about when I think about the, the legacy of racial bias in this country, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, all of the energies that were expended historically to deprive pe black people of the ability to be equal with their white counterparts. Who did that benefit? The, the, the presumption from someone like D'Angelo is that that somehow benefited white people or that it benefited America in general. And there is no universe in which that is true. I None mean, that's, that's one of the, the things that she insists on though, which is, which is interesting. And that's again, how it would mirror like an actual like white nationalist worldview in that she really does think like the entire, that's the entire story. It's about white people. Uh, she frequently says that racism is a problem for white people to solve. It's not a problem for other groups to solve. And uh, certainly what we know about the psychology research of prejudice shows that prejudice is pretty widespread. There sure. is uh, prejudice basically in every community. Now, of course she would retort by redefining the concept right. of racism by saying, no, it's, <laughs> No, no, racism power. is power plus prejudice. But even that conception is very, very thin in that power is very contextual. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, if you live in like a majority black city where like the mayor, the police chief, all the city council members are black, like I'm thinking about where I grew up, Atlanta, like outside Atlanta, uh, it's very, very difficult to say, oh, you know, it's still the whites are behind everything. Like, no, they aren't. Like black people can make choices. They are political and moral and social agents, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in hate crimes, a hate crime, the person who commits the crime has the power. Uh, if you're a black nationalist NOI type person who goes and shoots up a, a Jewish uh, supermarket, which happened recently, uh, mm -hmm. you, are, you are expressing power over someone else. It doesn't matter if you pull out the census sheet, like Jews earn more money than like non-Jewish black people or something like that. Like that's such a stupid definition of power because power is always contextual in every, in every context, uh, in, every, in every situation, like who has the power can change on, on, on a dime, which is why prejudice in general is bad. Like, it's not like some prejudice is great and some prejudice is like terrible. Like all prejudice pretty much drags us down, but not always equally. Um, and certainly uh, in the, over the course of American history, uh, it's pretty clear, uh, most of the prejudice has gone in one direction, but it doesn't mean particularly as we diversify and become, you know, as people from non-white backgrounds become more socially, economically, and politically powerful, that their expression of prejudice can't carry power or weight. It certainly mm -hmm. can. I mean, for instance, like in Miami in the 1980s, uh, rioting and violence between Cuban Americans and African Americans, neither ones were white, neither of them were white, but people got hurt because people were expressing power 
during that violence, right? They were, they were, it actually had real world tangible outcomes for people. It wasn't just harmless like jokes. Like it's true that if you're in a room of like a hundred people and 99 of them are in X group and one of them is in Y group and the one Y group person is shouting at the 99 X, yeah, that it's maybe harmless prejudice, but that's not actually the social situation we're in. We're in all kinds of situations where uh, people get bullied, they get harassed. It doesn't really matter what your, 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 your group type is. I mean, even if you look at hate crime statistics, I think mm -hmm. virtually every group is well represented in hate crime stats. In fact, I think whites are actually underrepresented overall versus their share in the population in hate crime statistics. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I, I just think she's, she's presented such a thin view of the world. And I think one, one of you had brought this up that there is a chance that a lot of this will backfire and actually make, make even white people more prejudiced. Um, there's actually a lot of research on diversity trainings, on on uh, kind of anti-bias, anti-prejudice training. And I'm thinking about one paper in particular, it's called Ironic Effects of Anti-Prejudice Messages. Uh, it's by Lisa Legault and her team. At, uh, she's at Clarkson University. And what she did is she gave out brochures and she gave out questionnaires to, to different groups of participants. One group of brochures and questionnaires, like they basically they had messaging that was designed around telling you about how diversity is positive, how there are benefits for you, how you like being around people with other cultures. And she found that those were pretty effective. Uh, but then another one was kind of the D'Angelo type stuff, which was talking about how racism is your problem, how it's a shame, how you should feel guilty. And actually when she gave those to people, it was actually worse. They, had, they actually uh, became more prejudiced than, than people who hadn't gotten any kind of uh, treatment or experiment. Uh, it actually backfired to give people this messaging that they're like inherently guilty, that there's something wrong with them, that they should feel ashamed, that they need to repent. Like the, this type of messaging generally does backfire. And I, I, I have a feeling that a lot of people who are reading this book, they might be doing it for social you know, propriety. They might be trying to portray a certain image by owning it, by not speaking up. But what we're really talking about is people's hearts and minds. And in their heart and their mind, they may actually be becoming more pre prejudiced because they feel like they're being targeted or singled out. Uh, because a very complex problem has been made very narrow. Right. Uh, I'm Especially, wondering if you guys are seeing that. Um, I talked to, I interviewed a woman for our podcast who went through a year of of, of diversity training with Robin D'Angelo. Um, and she told me basically that. She didn't say it made me more racist, but she went into the training as sort of a D'Angelo acolyte. Um, and then what she experienced made her go the opposite direction. And I'm not saying that she joined, she's not, like, she's not like an avowed racist by any means, but she is no longer considers herself anti-racist. Um, and she did have this sort of political awakening after, after going through this, uh, going through this training. And part of it was because she started to analyze her own interactions with her colleagues in a way that she was uncomfortable with, right? So she started to feel like she she complimented a black guy on his suit, and then she was sort of, you know, like analyzing that, like, did I only tell, did I only compliment him on his suit because he's, you know, he's black and I have lower standards for for black people's fashion? And then at one point, actually, the thing that really sort of switched for her was that she was a graphic designer at this organization, and uh, one of her colleagues complained to D'Angelo because they saw a hidden she had there were it was a, a theater company and the company um for a, they were showing the odyssey and for in this poster she's she sourced a, like an ancient greek pot and it had these like interlocking designs and one of her colleagues anonymously complained to robin d'angelo because he saw a swastika in this design and so then so then during this like small group training with just her and her colleagues you know, the trainer says, like, now we need to talk about the swastikas in the Odyssey poster. And so all of her colleagues know who this is. She's humiliated. And she's told before the session, you are not allowed to defend yourself. If you're a white person and you are called out, you are not allowed to defend yourself. And it was just such a humiliating experience for her that it, it like, it, it, it turned her off of all of D'Angelo's shit. She also... She said the last she like drew her line in the sand because they were instructed to form white affinity groups and and like POC affinity groups. And she was just so like the light like just she was so freaked out by that that she just was like, I can't do this. I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't you know, I I just have a, such a hard time wrapping my mind around the idea that, you know, r racism is created by the idea that you believe that race is an essential kind of characteristic. Mm -hmm. that it carries weight uh the same way like i said like okay what's a characteristic i don't know comedy movies comedic movies uh you can like comedic movies or you can dislike them because they have so many characteristics right you might be the kind of person who doesn't like them uh if race t comes takes on all these characteristics 
then you're then it has weight. You can judge it. You can say, oh, I like that kind of person. I don't like that kind of person. The thing that classically has debunked racism, the thing that King, Bayard Rustin, uh, classical kind of civil rights movement preached was that race is, is an irrelevant characteristic of somebody, uh, that it would be irrational to discriminate someone based on a race, be thinking about weight as actually carrying weight uh, in terms of how you, you treat and accommodate somebody. Uh, it would be similar to treating or accommodating people on hair color differently or on height differently. Um, so it's, it's, it's very bizarre for me to see this sort of thing happening. And I guess part of that is that, you know, D'Angelo is not actually a social scientist. She's not a psychologist, she's not a social psychologist and evolutionary psychologist. She doesn't run experiments on people. No. She doesn't actually try to grade what she do does. Like it's never evaluated. Um, and I know people who do, because I spent a long time working on a project at Berkeley related to bridging divides. And a lot of their advice runs very contrary to what D'Angelo is saying. So for instance, Susan Fisk, she's a psychologist over, I believe that she's at Yale now. She ran an experiment where she found that, yeah, a lot of white folks did have like a threat response to seeing like a black face, like a, an immediate kind of quick response. Uh, that's part of, you know, what you get from social biases, so on and so forth. But she found a very quick way to deactivate it uh, using brain scans. She's, she just asked them, instead of trying to categorize them, like, you know, she would ask someone like, how old is this black person? And like, that would actually create a threat response. So they're trying to categorize them. She would ask them instead, like, what kind of vegetables do they like to eat? And immediately, like, the threat response in the brain went away. And the reason why is, and you can ask any number of questions like that, is because when you ask a question like that, you're no longer thinking of that person as a category. Mm -hmm. You're you're thinking about them as a person. You're thinking, like, what's in their mind? Like, hmm, I right. wonder who that person in particular, because we don't smell like we have stereotypes about eating vegetables, right? You really have to think about that person, their interests, so on and so forth. So I think that's a lot of what bothers me about D'Angelo, is that what she's mm -hmm. preaching actually runs contrary to the established science about how we deal with interpersonal racism, which is through individuation. You actually learn to see people as individuals. And the more that you do that, the less bias you carry towards other people. Now, of course, that's different than like sociological thinking, thinking about like national and global inequality and public policy. And like, that's a whole different thing. But her entire shtick is kind of healing relationships between individuals. But, at but the she's same going time, in the wrong direction. Right? She, I mean, <laughs> she, she preaches against individualism. That's one of the like, basic Ex tenets of this book. Explicitly. Yeah. Is that individualism is a tenet of white fragility and, and therefore white supremacy. <laughs> well, I, well, that was the, a part of an abstract of a paper of hers that she wrote in 2010 called Why Can't We All Just Be Individuals? Countering the Discourse of Individualism and Anti-Racist Education. She, you know, she says, and I'm quoting this further, being viewed as an individual is a privilege only available <laughs> to the dominant group. Yeah. So she's basically ruled it out for me. Like, I can't do it. Like, I, got, <laughs> sorry, I have to, call up, all my, sorry, I have to call up all my friends and tell them, I'm sorry, you know, you can't yeah. call me my name anymore. Just, yeah. just have, give me an ethnic designator and it's done. Yeah. And like, that's yeah. all it is. But, you know, if you, if you browse the paper, she doesn't actually go through like, like, she doesn't do any like serious like research or anything to, to prove this. She asserts it over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like all, that's like her whole book. That's everything she does. Is she's asserting something over and over, but she seems resistant to any evidence and the contrary. And honestly, it's, it's somewhat of a convenient construct for her, for her to mm -hmm. say that, you know, there's a dominant group, that dominant group decides basically everything. I happen to be in it, yeah. but I, you know, if you pay me money, maybe I can cure, help you, you know, manage this dominant group. I don't know. It seems a little self-serving, although I'm not sure whether she believes it or not. What do you, what do you guys think? Is this, is this like whole thing a con or is like, is she a true believer? <laughs> I, I'm 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 inclined to believe that she genuinely believes this, uh, just as I'm inclined to believe that Kendi genuinely believes this. And it's worth mentioning that there are some meaningful differences between the way uh, Kendi seems to think about racism and even anti-racism, and certainly the possibility of black people being individuals and white people being individuals, for that matter. Um, so it's not as though there's only one variety of this, but I would say that the sort of essentialist thinking is a fundamental component of the anti-racist project. That thinking about people, even if you're going to allow them some degree of individual autonomy, at the end of the day, they're always black people. They're always white people. And as a result, there are certain characteristics that they simply cannot avoid and can't escape, and certain things about themselves that perhaps they cannot undo. And in, in that very way, um, I, 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 that is what I find most disconcerting uh, about the present moment and about these, the prevalence of these ideas. 
Um, and I, I think ultimately it's the thing that makes it the most dangerous as well. There is something inherently valuable about us being able to relate to one another as individuals and about us being able to understand that when we talk about things like privilege and power, that the circumstance in the context matters and that it, it is, I, I'm going around Brooklyn having recently returned here while you know still on lockdown in some respects, I'm struck by the Black Lives Matter posters that I see all over the place, by the people who scrawled it on the masks that they're wearing on their faces in Sharpie and on their t-shirts because they apparently can't get enough paraphernalia. <laughs> um, I, I, I said there's something that you know struck me yesterday. I, I appreciate that everyone wants to do good, that they want to be seen as a part of a solution to a problem. I, I bristle at the, the lack of thoughtfulness that's going into this project though. And I, I am someone who has not ever felt um, in his adult life particularly conscious about his appearance in that respect. You know, I'm sufficiently handsome that I don't have to think about it. But I find myself walking around Brooklyn now and I can, f it's almost, it's palpable. Like this sense that people are aware of my appearance and are perhaps making all sorts of assumptions about the privilege they enjoy and that I don't. And it's, it's a bit infuriating because it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, Think about all the I shit you could get away with. It's just crazy. You could just uh, take advantage so. of these people. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to, though. I would, rather, I would rather us all work together and just to be viewed you know, as an individual. I, to right. make a generalization, I feel like, you know, my, my uh, parents are from overseas. Spent a little bit of time overseas, just like summers traveling and so on and so forth. And I think one of the biggest difference you'd notice coming from overseas, to like developing world, a lot of older cultures to the United States is that there just is a lot less like tribalism in the United States. Like in other mm -hmm. countries, people will, will judge you based on a bunch of characteristics you may not even think of here. So like, for instance, <laughs> like your tribe or your caste is like a huge thing in the South Asian subcontinent. Like you got to, you know, it's good to marry within them. People die because their parents kill them because they don't, you know, adhere to these things. I barely even think about those things now that I'm in the United, you know, I was born in the United States. And now that I am in the United States, I don't, I don't really think about it. Like it's never reinforced by anyone. So I just, it never really even crosses into my mind. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot that like, I don't have to think about who I, I didn't have to decide, you know, who I marry based on tribe. I didn't have mm. to. I really like being seen as an individual. It's a really, it is, it is very powerful. It is, it is actually like one of the most powerful things you can have when you have thousands of years of tribalism of sect, caste, tribe, class, uh, in, in the U S context for the past two or 300 years been race. Uh, these categories are very, feel very, very diminishing to you when you don't want to be in them. I understand a lot of people find comfort in them. They think, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm part of this group. I have loved being part of this group. But I guess my my point would be that there are other ways, other sorts of groups you can conceptualize yourself as being part of. Like you could feel like you're part of a culture, but culture doesn't have to be defined by a skin color. Like you can go in sure. and out of a culture. You can uh, you can join a different culture. Um, you know, I it's funny. Some of the most like adherent like Muslims I know are white folks who converted to Islam, mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. they're culturally very similar to my parents, right? Like their skin color doesn't really seem to make any difference at all. Uh, some of them speak, uh, you know, Urdu or Hindi just as well as they do, uh, better than I do. Um, I love that. I love that you can just hop in and out of cultures. And I would never try to say that everyone should just be in the same culture. And like, it makes me really uncomfortable when I read about France or Turkey uh, during Ataturk, you know, trying to suppress religion or force everyone into this kind of one civic culture. I think multiculturalism is great. But having it defined by race has us making assumptions about people and boxing them into a corner to where they just can't be different. I mean, D'Angelo is saying that 200 million people carry this sin and this guilt and they should write up contracts basically before they interact with someone. with And they sunburn. Color. It's terrible. <laughs> and this group, this group has one of the highest suicide rates in the entire country. I mean, whites have mm. a suicide rate that's like two or three times as high as blacks, Latinos, Asians. My group, Asians, has the lowest. I just, I just, I don't feel, it feels cruel, even, yeah. even though I find this book to be very diminishing towards non-white people because it treats us all as like robots or whatever. It feels cruel towards white people. And I, yeah. even, the, even the concept, white fragility, 
of course someone's going to like get standoffish and defensive when you just tell them they disparage them in the way that she's doing. If somebody came up to me and wrote a book, Pakistani Fragility, and even if half the book was like correct, like it was correct criticisms of Pakistan, I'd still be like, okay, this is not productive. This is not, you know, conducive to a great conversation. Like you're just attacking me, right? Like you're just telling me I'm at the center of all the sin in the world uh, rather than having a kind of nuanced conversation, which I think these issues demand. And it's, I, I just, I don't know if I can think of another time in history where, where a group was targeted for this kind of like invective and members of the group were like standing up and like saying proudly that I want to be the target of this invective. Oh, I am white fragile. I have privilege. I mean, what do you guys, I mean, maybe Katie, you're the subject matter expert via, via skin shade here. Why, why, are, <laughs> white, why are white, why are, I don't, I don't think non-white people are, are the bulk of the, the, the buyers of this book. I think this is no, really no, a book for is, white people oh. and they're the ones buying it. And why are they, yeah. why are they doing this? I don't, I can't imagine yeah. any other groups that subjecting themselves this way. I, okay. I think it's twofold. I think one is a genuine, um, a fear of being on the wrong side of history. I think mm. that um, white liberals in particular, so I am the demographic for this book, um, although probably a little too contrarian to, to be the actual demographic. Um, I think that's part of it is a, is a real a real desire to do the right thing. And we do live, you know, even if this is the most multicultural nation, not just on earth currently, but actually in the history of the, of the human, the human species. Um, and, and one of the most tolerant nations, uh, you know, in the history of, in the history of humanity, which is true. I mean, there's still slavery going on actively in many parts of the world right now. So even if these things are true, we do live in, there's a lot of segregation in this world, a lot of segregation. I mean, I grew up in an area, there was one black family in my school. I went through a kindergarten through eighth grade school. There was one black family in that school, you know, and this is not because there was a, I just, I grew up in like the rural, rural Appalachian South. Like this is just, it was highly segregated. Um, you know, we do sort of tend to stick to our, to our, our, uh, our professional networks tend to be more segregated, um, and that goes, I think, especially true for sort of the, blue, the you know, white-collar professional jobs. And so there's a, a recognition of that and an honest desire to be on the right side of history. That's part of it. I think the bigger part of it is that it's trendy as fuck. And I, I, that's like the cynical way of saying it, but I think this is a meme. I mean, my social, like I had, I like deleted Instagram from my phone and I'm going to refuse to check it until this shit goes away because I, it's making me actually dislike my own friends, my real friend, my white friends. It's making me dislike my white friends because they're all posting fucking photos of this book and telling each other to buy it. And when I push back, uh, they accuse me of, you know, of like, that's my white fragility speaking. This, this, this happened. Um, so I think that's part of it is like a real desire. It's, it's twofold, a real desire to like, think you're doing the right thing, a lack of like critical reasoning skills, a lack of of actual relationships with other people with people of other races so you you sort of think like I, I don't have any black friends well Robin D'Angelo must be right although I'm telling you Robin D'Angelo does not have any black friends who also are not diversity trainers um and then also it's just like you know it's a meme like people are fucking we are people are mostly followers and this is the thing right now I it is I've I've thought about what what sort of historical or international analogy there is to what's happening with this and you know, I grew up also in the South, although not Appalachian South, I grew up outside Atlanta. And I think the closest analogy I can find to this is uh, religious revival mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or Orthodox religion, uh, where people are encouraged to state their sins, to speak their sins very loudly, uh, to proclaim that they recognize and acknowledge their sins. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is that part of this? Is that that are the people doing this many of them you know they maybe they've fallen out of religion or they're not traditionally religious but this is fulfilling this similar kind of psychological need for them to kind of be part of a more a larger morality story uh because that also would be why it's so evidence resi evident resistance like if mm -hmm. if i ever whenever i try to poke holes in anything that's critical race theory uh it may be that people acknowledge that I'm factually right, but they still won't agree. And of course, yeah. that's any strong political belief. But this one seems, you know, Robin D'Angelo's entire thesis is that if you push back, you're fragile, which I right. guess because I'm not white, I'm not fragile. But I guess I, I'm not even in the story. I'm not in the book. Right. Uh, <laughs> apparently, there aren't any non-white people who disagree with this book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm just I'm just wondering if this is if this is fulfilling a, a religious sense for a lot of people. I and mean, we've seen even in these Black Lives Matter protests, they've done demographic data on them and 
they're all disproportionately white in most cities, like almost mm -hmm. all cities. I, I, there's a really great uh, Detroit reporter, who, Niraj Wariku, who was noting that in Detroit, the protest groups like tons and tons of white folks. And a lot of the black people in Detroit were actually kind of upset when they started vandalizing things like, why are you coming to our city and doing this? Right. Like, yeah. Um, but it's just bizarre to me because it's difficult to think of a majority group that is self-flagellated in the same way, right? Like it has just made so much of the story about themselves and in ways that are very psychologically unhealthy because it seems like some there's some amount of self-loathing going on there. I know that's kind of a meme on maybe the far right that people self-loathing white people or whatever, but like I actually see it now. So I'm starting I'm starting to see that as a phenomenon. I just it's very hard to understand. Yeah, I I've frequently thought about growing up in the in the church and going to church with my grandmother on a on a Saturday, who's Seventh day Adventist. And there was a particular passion when the pastor who showed up was really into the fire and the brimstone. And there was an accounting of all of the awfulness within the church. Like folks would, would, would moan a little louder. They'd amen a little harder. The clapping was a little, was a little louder. It just, there is something about the appetite for that. Um, that perhaps makes the whole thing seem a little bit more real and, and more powerful. And I'm, I'm not really sure how to analyze that. I will say that I've, I've experienced a lot of the present moment um, a, a lot differently um, than Katie described, because most of my friends who I've talked to about this, who I don't uh, sort of deal with in a circumstance like this, the way we are, and we have a similar point of view on this, um, like friends from college, a lot of black friends from college, many of whom are, are sort of affirmatively black in the sense that they self-identify that way um, and have rather conventional, uh, conventionally black politics, if that's a phrase I can use without being offensive. Um, but I have noticed that they're adopting a lot of the same sort of anti-racist language in ways that has surprised me. And there is a, an intensity uh, to to their beliefs in many instances that again is sort of surprised me. So, you know, while I hope this goes away and you can jump back onto Instagram soon, there are bits of this that seem durable and that seem to be having a material impact on the culture. And I suspect it has a lot to do with the unusual circumstance we find ourselves in with the pandemic and the general sense of insecurity that everyone feels right now. Um, and that is likely to become more pronounced in time and having a very clear sense of who to hate, even if it is in some way, shape or form you, um, can perhaps be reassuring, uh, and I'm, I'm shrinking folks here, um, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, but, but there is something very unusual and obviously religious uh, about what's taking place right now. Yeah, I think, um, I think I, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, but I th think we should be looking at sort of communist histories and totalitarian histories um, for guidance here, you know, and mm -hmm. I spoke to a woman from Romania recently who grew up during uh, under you know authoritarian communist Romania and she was telling me about these these mandatory self-criticism sessions they would have and this you know obviously like that's top down what's happening now is bottom up but you see so many of the same parallels where you would have you know the bourgeois would stand up and sort of admit their admit their uh their thought crimes their sins against the working class against the proletariat um and I see a lot of parallels with that too and there is this sort of religious element a secular religious re religious element of it um but yeah I think the I I think the pandemic is and joblessness and, and like is a is a huge part of that um everything <laughs> man shit is bad right now it is just it is it is bad and it is getting worse and one thing i'm also concerned about in terms of backlash like i'm deeply concerned about that this is this could be a moment for actual white supremacists for actual white nationalists which i do not i don't want to overstate the threat of white nationalists i don't think that we we like there are clearly white nationalism exists, but I do not think they are in any danger of gaining cultural power at this moment. That said, I don't think that it's a good idea to make a bunch of white people feel resentful because of the way they were born. I don't think that's a good idea. That's just, I don't think it's a good idea. It's a fucking recruiting tool right there. Um, and I also don't think it's a good idea to make black people 
reevaluate or evaluate every interaction that they have through the lens of race. Wow. You know, so yeah. if, like at one point, D'Angelo apologized to her co-facilitator, who was a black woman, because she interrupted her. And this was an act of, of white supremacy. And this idea that every time there's any sort of slight or any, any I don't know, any sort of, I don't know, any slight between like a, a white person does anything to a black person or any person of color, that that means it's necessarily racist. I think that's really dangerous because I don't want to live in a world where all black people think that if I like don't see like if I cut them off in traffic, that's a racial aggression. Well, I think uh, and speaking to what Canal's point was earlier, that perhaps he does have non-white people in his social circle yeah. who are starting to talk like this. Yeah. Uh, if you come at this from my point of view, which is that like race is a social fiction, it really doesn't right. define anything about anybody. But something that does actually impact people's social networks, right? Like if you're in a particular social network and you have to do certain things to get ahead, you're going to start doing them. And I think that if this has become a huge professional class thing, if Fortune 500 companies are promoting this book, if they're offering trainings, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hired uh, D'Angelo to do things, Unilever hired D'Angelo to do things. These, I think there's plenty of incentives if you're a non-white person to start saying, well, your colleagues are racist, uh, this is a white supremacist structure that I'm in, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because it'll lead to deference to you. Like you'll actually get powers and, and privileges in your workplace if you start going along with it. Even if you know, even if at first you think it's wrong, uh, you know, as Upton Sinclair said, you know, anything that a, a man's paycheck relies on, you know, it's much easier to get them to believe it. And I think that if you lay out those kind of perverse incentives, both white people and non-white people will go along. And it has nothing to do with the fact that their skin is white or not white. It's just the social network that they're in. And, and that, if that becomes a way to promote yourself within, within that network, I think tons of people will get involved in it for that reason. Uh, I can think mm -hmm. of numerous friends. I'm not going to name names here. People I worked with in kind of the NGO, journalism, industrial complex, mm -hmm. uh, who had very moderate politics when I worked with them. We thought I was like a crazy quasi-communist, radical, or whatever, right? And um, I see their writing now around these topics. And so much of it just comes across as like they're going with a crowd who is making this the way uh, to advance your career. Like you will go to the top of the charts if you just nod your head and say, yeah, D'Angelo is correct about everything. Abraham Kendi is correct about everything. Um, it has kind of become somehow very quickly without a whole lot of public consent, because I think most Americans don't really think this way at this point, uh, it's somehow become the establishment, the cultural establishment, very, very mm -hmm. quickly in ways that I can't really remember any other cultural shifts that happened this quickly at this level. Yeah, I have no, I have no, th there's nothing that I can think of, nothing in my lifetime, certainly nothing from a historical standpoint that I can, I can think of that, that rivals it. There's, there's one, there's one thought that, that I'd like to share. It's um, my favorite uh, passage from James Baldwin, and it's perhaps the one that I think is the, the least well known, perhaps maybe most overlooked, um, and also most essential passage from the fire next time. And it's when he describes the gates of paranoia. Um, and he talks about how black people being in this unique position of having always had historically, you know, white people be this evil, malevolent force in their lives, um, risk having the gates of paranoia close on them, which is to say, as you were describing, Katie, in every single interaction, they could find ways to imagine that what's happening here is some sort of malevolent racist plot and that they can find that it happens in in every imaginable circumstance and they no longer find themselves even attempting to differentiate between something that is real and something that is imagined and that they find themselves doing that and don't even realize that this process has taken hold. And it has long been my contention um, and concern that to the extent blackness is a thing from a cultural standpoint, one of, in my experience, the, the most consistent features of black identity is a sense that there is this specter of oppression in society, that there is in fact already a baseline of sort of racial paranoia that exists there. Um, and it, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways, the prevalence of conspiracy theories, um, the, uh, the general uh, suspicion of white people in various professional settings as some studies have pointed to uh, uh, speci specifically um, in the context of healthcare in some instances. Um, that is a dangerous circumstance and one that I do worry about getting worse. Um, and it's 
really amongst the principal reasons why I found myself personally rejecting any sort of racial identification at all, because it wasn't something that I, I wanted to be a part of. And it was certainly something that is, is taught and is pretty universal. And I, you know, as, as late as, you know, being in, in college, I found myself um, thinking about the world in that way. And it is a, it's a massive cognitive load to try to labor under in a professional setting, to be at work and to feel as though you're constantly under threat on account of your blackness, to, to be trying to be successful in academia and to worry about that. I, I, it is a burden that will necessarily have a deleterious impact on your ability to be successful. And there are a lot of reasons to respond to it by sort of reinforcing that dynamic. Um, if everyone else around you similarly has these contentions to sort of buy into, you know, a theory that race is what explains some circumstance without thinking about it. It's, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, so. And look, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that this mentality that you described, uh, does have some real world roots. I mean, there are people alive today who grew up under mm -hmm. Jim Crow. Sure. And if you grew up under Jim Crow, it's a pretty safe assumption that frequently you are going to be discriminated against, threatened, uh, some people were even physically harmed or, of course, mm -hmm. many people were killed due to the color of their skin. The, the, the question is, though, at what point does the, that mentality uh, fail to fit events? Um, should you be looking for it? You know, should you be looking for that explanation everywhere? Because if you start looking for something everywhere, eventually you're going to start seeing it where it isn't. And yeah. I think that's something we've seen in a lot of like post-colonial countries as well. Like, there is a big type of, there is a wing of like nationalist politics in countries like India and Pakistan and Nigeria, uh, a number, Kenya, a number of other countries where decades after colonialism has ended, people are still kind of organizing as if it still exists there and, and treating their grievances as if they still exist. Uh, in the Cultural Revolution in China, we were talking about totalitarian societies. Uh, they would make people recite, you know, word for word what happened in the opium wars, like over and over and over. Opium wars are pretty messed up. Like, you know, you don't have to, it's not hard to, to make me rag on, you know, the, the imperialist West and so on and so forth, um, having been descended from from the same uh, situation. Uh, but reciting that over and over and viewing your entire life through the prism of the West is out to get me or the white people are out to get me, I think can be intensely psychologically damaging. And here along comes this book telling you actually it's true and look at all the white people buying it. They must agree too. Like, this is very true. They are all out to get you constantly. Uh, and there's really nothing you can do about it except hope that we're better people, you know, which is as a historical bet, if you, if you really do believe that everyone, everything is white supremacy and everyone's a white supremacist, it's not a, it's not a great historical bet to just hope they'll just change their mind one day, right? Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, I really do think books like this just have such a deleterious effect on both groups of people, whether you're white or non-white. And it's hard for me to find a whole lot of value in it other than maybe hopefully forcing some people to confront some of these ideas, because I think the ideas have been out there for quite some time. And uh, they've just been kind of quietly growing without a lot of pushback. Yeah, she was on, uh, Robin D'Angelo was on uh, Jimmy Fallon last week or the week before. So this is not, you know, this, all this critical race theory and stuff is clearly this is filtered down from academia. And also, I think it's important to note that Raman D'Angelo is maybe the, um, the most obvious uh, purveyor of this rhetoric. But this is, this is, this shit is being spread, you know, in boardrooms and conference rooms and schools all over America. Um, so it's not just her, unfortunately. And I think she has a lot more cultural power than any of us do. Well, I think that's why we wanted to have uh, this conversation, uh, because I think that we kind of do have the power to push back on this. These are mm -hmm. these are mm -hmm. ideas, you know, these ideas came onto the scene so quickly. They kind of grabbed a bunch of hegemony in many institutions like universities and corporations and news media. Uh, we'll see how, how they fare at politics and government uh, maybe soon enough. Yeah. But we, you know, just as just as the concept of race itself is made and unmade, I mean, just as for hundreds of years, I wouldn't have been allowed to marry outside my tribe and everything I would have done from, you know, who I married it to where I worked to where I lived was dictated by my tribe, something which I don't even remember most days or think about most days. Uh, those ideas came and they went. And I think this exact same thing could happen with yeah. a lot of the, the critical theory and the kind of the woke social justice that's 
unfortunately, I think giving social justice a bad name because there is racism, there is discrimination. I think the government should be doing much more policy to promote opportunity and access uh, to wealth in particular to, to more and more people. Uh, but I don't think we should start demonizing each other for the color of our skin. And I just, I feel bad for white people who are reading this book <laughs> yeah. and thinking that they're so awful when really they're not that awful. I mean, I, you're probably as racist as I am, honestly, if you're a white person <laughs> it reading this book, on the day. which is like, you know, maybe it is like, you know, a little bit, a little yeah. bit sometimes. And just like being greedy sometimes or being lazy sometimes or being incompetent Jeez. sometimes, just check yourself, make a note of it, try to do a little bit better next time. And uh, don't, don't beat yourself up about it. Like it's not healthy. Uh, if you want to go help somebody, go volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club at a homeless shelter. It's, you know, I did that for quite some time in Atlanta. It was a very rewarding experience for me and helped a lot of people. Um, so go and do something. You know, don't, don't self-flagellate. That's not, that's not good for anyone. But uh, I'm so happy to have both of you on here to talk about this um, and, and, to, and to give to, to, to probably that message of, of not self-flagellating. So. <laughs> Stop beating yourself up, white, fellow whites. <laughs> Bold, bold idea, not to judge one one another on the the basis of our race. That's maybe maybe one day that'll catch on. 